1966, my mom gave John Wayne an enema. For real. She was the registered nurse in L.A. County Hospital, and John Wayne walked in with tummy trouble, and the doctor diagnosed him with an enema, and my mom performed an enema on John Wayne. And then she had the gall to ask him for his autograph, and she has it framed and hanging in her bathroom today. <laughs> and she says to me, it was perfect timing. I'm not sure John Wayne would agree. In fact, I think the Duke probably had a tough night, okay? But this is a common misuse of the word perfect, perfection, perfectionism. It's a problem. It's a problem in church, and it's a problem with discipleship. The great social worker, social study, social investment, social researcher, Brene Brown, studier of shame, says that perfectionism is contagious in all the wrong ways. It brings about blame and shame and judgment. And she says the opposite of perfectionism is healthy striving. So where healthy striving is very internal, perfectionism is very external. And when we strive for it, we become yet another photoshopped member of society. It's an ideology or a form that's, that's beyond our imagination. It's archetypal. Thank you, Plato. It's something that we never can actually attain. Whereas healthy striving is the internal struggle to better self. Well, how does this affect discipleship? Well, if shame, blame, and judgment come from perfectionism, when we think that holiness is perfection, it brings about self-criticism, judgmentalism, despair, Catholic Twitter. It doesn't work. And this is a problem. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The question is really, are you willing to be a candid Polaroid in a photoshopped world? You're imperfect, just like me. Congratulations, right? We're sinners, right? St. Peter in 2 Peter, he says, we're like dogs who return to our own vomit. Great image, Peter. Thanks a lot. That's us. We're broken. And if we equate the word holiness with perfection, then we think by our own merits interacting with the perfect God that we're going to be something that's not real, that we want to become a photoshopped image. That's a mistake. So real healthy discipleship comes from embracing this idea of being a snapshot, a perfectly made snapshot, perfectly made in our own imperfection to be filled by his gifts. And what are those gifts? The gifts are grace and the gifts are mercy. Grace, right? God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy, God not giving us what we do deserve. His perfection is what we would call sanctification, right? That's a heavenly gift. That's not an earthly thing. Grace and mercy are the earthly gifts. And this is where we move forward with another problem because we read in scripture in Matthew 5, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Crud. What do we do with that? Well, thank you, St. Paul, right? Who says in Romans 12, do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. So for Paul, he explains to us, it's not about being perfect. It's about embracing the perfect will of a perfect God, which is good and pleasing. It's about interacting with grace and mercy. Let me give you an example. In my 25 years of doing youth ministry in diocesan direction, I still was teaching confirmation classes not too long ago. And I know confirmation, the sacrament of confirmation in the Catholic church, man, we could go on and on about this. How many young people have we confirmed that have just absolutely bailed on the church? And I was getting sick of it. Now, in my diocese, we confirm 16 and 17-year-olds, and so we have the class, and they all come together, and some dioceses teach for two years. My diocese has seven primary sessions. So I went to my pastor, and I said, listen, let's try something. How about every single class, mom and dad, or one or other, their sponsor and the candidate come to every class? So it's a journey of family. And he said, great. And I said, excellent. And it was terrible. 
I mean, it went bad. First meeting, I set up the room with a bunch of pods of chairs and they all sat together, mom, dad, sponsor, and teen. I got up to introduce myself, the calendar, and give my curriculum vitae, because that's basically what you have to do to justify your teaching ability to the parents. And then I sat down and I said, okay, parents, you have 15 minutes. Convince your kid to be Catholic. Go. How do you think it went? I saw moms and dads give their teenagers permission to play on their phones, and then they did the same. I saw moms and dads use the word Jesus for the first time in a sentence with their teenage child. I saw moms and dads totally blow it. And the sponsor looked at them like, are you kidding me? And take over. And I saw teens evangelize their parents. We have a problem. If we think that being able to share the faith means being perfect before we can do it, we are dogs returning to vomit. And it's not going to work, and it never has. But if we are a people that are photoshopped in fakeness, and we think that that striving is the pursuit, we're going to err. But if we can be the Polaroid, the imperfect being, and say, give me grace, give me mercy, his voice will come through us, and we will teach the faith. What is the will of God in a confirmation class? right? Grace and mercy. Love one another as I have loved you. This isn't complicated. It's just hard work. And we have to do it better. Let me give you an example. We're taught to be obedient, not perfect. And obedience to the will is where we can succeed. In 2002, I was at World Youth Day in Toronto, Canada. It was actually one of the smaller World Youth Days. There was only 800,000 people there. It was one of many that I've been to. I was a youth minister. I had a group of 29. It was the last World Youth Day that St. John Paul II would attend. And back in the day, they would do an opening mass with the Pope. And we were late because I'm a youth minister and that's what I am. I'm late. So we were all the way in the back. And we get there and it takes 45 minutes for all the flags of all the countries represented to process to the top of a seven story altar that they had created for that one mass. It was amazing. So mass is going on. We get towards the middle and this 16 year old boy named Carter leans into me and he goes, hey, how are they going to do communion? Like there's a lot of us. We're going to make a bunch of lines. And I looked at him. I was like, no, no, it's amazing. In just a couple minutes. About 5,000 extraordinary Eucharistic ministers are going to come around that bend. And they're going to be walking with people with yellow umbrellas. And they're going to pop open the umbrellas. And they're going to levitate above the crowd like Mary Poppins and go, body of Christ, body of Christ, body of Christ. And he looked at me like, (laughs) and he walked off. And a couple minutes later, 5,000 Eucharistic ministers came around the corner. And he saw a bunch of yellow umbrellas pop up. And he looked at me and he goes, oh my gosh. (laughs) But all they do is walk into the crowd and distribute the best they can. And an umbrella popped up about 100 yards away from me this way, and the whole crowd turned, and I went from here to here in about 15 minutes. And then the umbrella disappeared, and he was gone. And I was thinking, oh, no. So being a youth minister, I kind of leaned in. I was like, okay, um, we're all the body of Christ, and sometimes we don't, right? But Carter looked at me, and he goes, no way. And he put his head down, And he started running in the crowd towards where that umbrella was. And I mean, he was running. He was elbowing nuns. I mean, it was outstanding, right? I got so angry. I was like, no way. I just lost a kid at mass. I was furious. My group of 29 was now 28. I was going to have to call his parents and say, I lost your son at mass. And when I find him, I'm going to kill him, right? So mass is over. The parking lot's empty. It's my group of 28, and I'm genuinely angry, and I'm genuinely frustrated. And I lean in, and I say, okay, guys, listen, just stay together. Let's work our way back to the altar. We'll see what we can do, right? And we start walking back, and I look, and I see this 16-year-old gangly white kid running across the parking lot like this. And he pops up, and he goes, look. And he had one consecrated host in his hand. And the first words out of his mouth were, line up. And he broke it 29 times. And he said, body of Christ, body of Christ. And I remember receiving 
that precious Eucharist, and never being so full. He understood obedience. He understood that it wasn't perfect, that it was messy, that he's a mess. The whole situation was a mess, but that the mission was to deliver the will. And the will was to feed us because it's what we need in our imperfectness. He understood it. Friends, it's a transition for us from just orthodoxy to orthopraxy. Orthodoxy, right teaching. It has nothing to do with liberal and conservative. Those are political terms. They have no business here. It's right teaching. But orthopraxy is right doing. It's right living. And right living is recognizing imperfection, allowing the perfect creator, the good, the pleasing will of God to flow through us in our good work. This is the compromise of holiness. And it's what we've always been built to do. Perhaps a perfect example of this is my youngest daughter, Gwendolyn. She's nine years old. She has Down syndrome. Now, when people see Down syndrome, it's a very visible genetic thing, right? You can see it in the eyes and in their body. She's kind of littler than others and cognitively very different. Down syndrome, right? Well, I have five daughters and four of them had already received their first communion. That's nerve wracking as it is as parents, right? When our kids are getting ready to receive, it's a nerve wracking experience, right? Well, now add special needs to the mix, right? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she's just, she's not going to get it. She's not going to be able to walk up there and be like, this is the definer of the universe, the creator, Jesus Christ, right? Who embodies all perfection that I'm taking into my body. And then I thought to myself, neither do any of you. I just want her to know it's sacred and beautiful and good. So we worked hard. And then the day came, right? It was time for her to receive. She was the first in line, a class of like 20. We go to a pretty small church. My wife was right behind her. And she walked up first. And you could see on everyone's faces, what's going to happen, right? And my wife is standing behind her. And these seven-year-olds are all like dressed beautifully. They look like angels. And they're staring down at my little Gwendolyn. And Father Dan says, body of Christ. And she lifts her hands and she says, amen. And she takes it into her body. Now, listen, I had elbowed moms in the face to get this photo, right? I was going to get the photo of my Gwendolyn. But then the real drama happens, right? Because you go from the precious body to the precious blood. This is where things can go poorly, right? Seven-year-olds receiving that, the taste, the wince, everybody has that photo. And I'm like, this is not going to go well. And she walks up to the cup and Deacon Steve says, blood of Christ. And she receives and she says, amen. And she didn't wince because she's Irish. And I lost it. And then I looked up and the whole church was silent. The musicians stopped. The moms were covering their faces. The seven-year-olds were all like, she did it. She did it. I can do it. The elderly, the young adults, the moms were blown away by the witness of the simple reception of perfection into her very visible imperfection. And that was it. It made sense to me. It made sense to me exactly what this thing is, what this holiness thing is. All my Gwendolyn knows how to do is love you. So when she hears love your neighbor as yourself, that comes second nature to us. We wrestle with it, don't we? She doesn't have enemies because she only knows how to let grace and mercy flow through her beauty and her innocence. If you're a mom or a dad and you've been asked to share the faith, you're not perfect and you're probably going to stink at it. Do it anyway, because it's always been that way. And if you're a young man or woman and you understand the simple nature that by the reception of Eucharist, it is your discipleship job to give it, do it and run to it and fearlessly share it. And in all of our own imperfections, there's an opportunity for absolute beauty to flow through us and to be given freely. I am certain that John Wayne did not think his encounter with my mom was perfect because it wasn't. But I know this. It wasn't supposed to be. We're imperfect. Moms and dads, 
I invite you to embrace the good, the pleasing, perfect will of God. Thank you.